you and good morning, everybody. We would like to thank the organizers of the summit for including us in this year's lineup. And also thank you to all of you for being here with us this morning for our presentation. I'm gonna begin by sharing a poem by Vietnamese Buddhist monk, peace activist and farmer, Thich Nhat Hanh. This poem also serves as instructions for the short touching the earth meditation I would like us to all do to ground ourselves before we begin the presentation. At conferences, we tend to become pretty disconnected from our bodies and breath, many days of sitting, listening, talking heads. So this is an offering in service of interrupting that a little bit and also to intentionally connect us to the earth before our presentation to give thanks to the land that provides all that we need and the ancestors who have cared for it. Bowing down to the earth, touching with your forehead and four limbs, deeply ground, make yourself as low as possible, emptying yourself, surrender yourself completely in order to become water, in order to become the earth and accept anything the earth will give you, including death. Because learning to die is a very wonderful way of learning how to be alive. If you do not know how to die, you don't know how to live. So the moment when you bow down, you accept everything that will happen to you. Because you are now free from the ideas of birth and death, of permanence and annihilation, you are no longer afraid of anything. So this practice of connecting to the earth, though best done outside, can also be done indoors, as I'm sure most of you will be doing this morning. So take a moment to find a comfortable place where you can be on the ground. So you can feel as supported and as, as much um, at peace and comfortable as possible. You might wanna grab a yoga mat if that's available to you, a towel, just anywhere on the ground that you feel um, you can put your body down and have as much of your body connected to the ground, to the earth. You can be kneeling with your forehead and limbs on the ground as suggested in the poem that I shared. If that does not feel supportive for your body, you can also be on your back. You could be comfortably seated in a chair just with your feet touching the earth, whatever will make you feel uh, the most at ease and most comfortable. Okay, so I'm gonna share a seven minute video which is narrated by Thich Nhat Hanh that will guide us through this touching the earth meditation. So no need to be disrupted by wondering when we're gonna come out of it. I will return us to this moment and there will also be a final bell that will bring us back to. So just relax as much as possible.
in gratitude, I bow to my ancestors in my blood family of all generations. See my father and my mother, whose blood and flesh and vitality are present in me, circulating in my veins and nourishing every cell in me. To my parents, I see my grandpa, grandma, on the paternal side as well as on the maternal side. The energy have entered me with all expectations, all experiences and wisdom transmitted from so many generations of ancestors. I carry in me the life, the blood, the experiences, the wisdom, the happiness and the sorrow of all generations. The suffering and the elements that are to be transformed, I am practicing to transform. I open my heart and my flesh and bones to receive the energy of insight, of love, and of experiences transmitted to me by all my ancestors. I have roots in my father, my mother, my grandfather, my grandmother, and all my ancestors. I am only the continuation of my ancestral lineage. Please support me, protect me, transmit to me more of your energy. I know where children and grandchildren are, ancestors are. I know parents always love and support their children and grandchildren although it happens sometimes that they are not able to express that love and support due to difficulties they encounter. My ancestors have built up a way of life that has expressed gratitude, joy, confidence, respect, and loving kindness. As a continuation of my ancestors, I bow down to the ground and this the energy of my ancestors. Please support, protect me, and give me. All right. Thank you everyone for participating in that. Begin to slowly come out of your supportive resting position and return to screen time where we will begin our presentation. Okay, hey, now for rich soil, billionaire farmland, and the future of food. 
It's important to note that we are coming to this topic as artists, not experts. And at the end, we'll be sharing links and resources, um, writing and research that were included in the presentation, as well as bibliography for further reading and exploration. The building problem, which is focused on Then this today, is the interpreter. I'm so sorry to interrupt. A your sound, the long your sound is breaking up. I'm, I'm so sorry. This that have worked to separate brown and. Sorry, this is the interpreter. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Your sound is breaking up, Jen. It's hard yes. to hear you. I heard you. Should I restart? That would be helpful, thank you. No worries. All right, and do feel free to just interrupt again, though I don't know if there's anything I can do about uh, the internet and connectivity issue at this point. Thank you. The billionaire buyout problem, which is the focus of our presentation today, is in many ways a continuation of the long-standing problems of wealth, power, and privilege that have worked to separate black, brown, indigenous, and working class people from the land. BIPOC and farmers of color have been subject to discriminatory federal, state, and local policy projects in the 20th centuries to receiving fewer government loans compared to their white counterparts. Black farmers lost around 90% of their farmland in the last century. I'm gonna share a brief outline of some of the historical narratives and policies that have led us to where we are now. This is not a complete history and does not by any means encapsulate all of the injustice and discrimination. In 1851, the US government decrees an Indian Appropriations Act which creates the reservation system that paves the way for the Homestead Act. The Indian reservation system was created to keep Native Americans off lands that European Americans wanted to settle. Native peoples were again forced to move to even smaller parcels of land called reservations. 11 years later in 1862, we see the launch of two policies centered on privileging white access and claims to land. The Morrill Act offered land to white only colleges that taught agriculture and made courses. The back is established in day. Here and on um, Jen, this is Lauren. It might be helpful to try and turn off your video. Of the video. We'll, might be able to... we'll do. Okay. Can you actually do that? I it, when I'm in the presentation, I can't control. Oh, things. gosh. Okay. Thank yeah, you. I got you. Mm -hmm. Opportunity for people to escape the racism and oppression of owners of their farmland. Those participants were called exodusters, left Kentucky at the end of the post Civil War Reconstruction period to experience freedom in the promised land of Kansas. Nicodemus represents the involvement of African Americans in the world and then great plains. It is only over time economic land practices emerge major and long conditions on BIPOC and work class farmers. Air 
is a system where the landlord and landowner planter allows a tenant to the this carpet that would remain and an island like to leave for opportunity. Sorry about that. Um, thank you all for bearing with us during these tech issues. Um, we will try and get Jen to potentially come over the phone um, to tune in. Um, I would like to uh, bring it over to um, our other presenter, potentially maybe um, Rosanna can go um, in place of Jen right at this moment while we're trying to sort things out, if that's okay with you. Oh, you're on mute. Yes, uh, Jen has the, the slideshow. So um, she can, she's back, she can share that. Yeah, I can share that. And Marzena, do you want There seems to be many issues on my end. Okay, yeah, I mean, I can, I can um, look at our slides and, and pick it up from, uh, from where we left off, if if you like, from our notes. Or I can call in. It just seems like there's a lot of difficulties right now. Sure, how to best proceed. Jen, if you want to send me the slides, I can try and present um, it while you're getting connected via phone. Let me first maybe just try and switch locations and see if that solves things. Just give me 120 seconds. So maybe I can refresh a little bit um, where Jen um, left off. Okay, here we go. Maybe she's back. Did you want to tell me where to best start from? I would say, yeah, at the Homestead Act of 1862. You um, bet. Started, yeah, to, to cut out a little, yeah, right, perfect. Coming to you from the Rizograph lab in my college, so hopefully no one needs to come into this room uh, during the presentation, but if not, bear, bear with us. All right, to the Homestead Act. Okay, 11 years later in 1862, we see the launch of two policies centering on privileging white access and claims to land. The Morrill Act offered land to white-only colleges that taught agriculture and mechanical courses. The Morrill Act is what established most of our land-grant institutions that we still have to this day. That same year, Lincoln signed the Homestead Act into law on May 20th, 1862. To achieve this, thousands of Native Americans were forced from their lands and onto Indian reservations to make way for homesteaders. 
In theory, the Homestead Act provided the opportunity for Black people to escape the racism and oppression of post-war South and become owners of their own tracts of private farmland. The large-scale Black migration from the South to Kansas came to be known as the Great Exodus, and those who participated in it were called exodusters. Formerly enslaved African Americans at the end of the post-Civil War Reconstruction period left to experience the freedom of the promised land of Kansas. Nicodemus represents the involvement of African Americans in the westward expansion and settlement of the Great Plains. It is the oldest and only remaining Black settlement west of the Mississippi River. Around this time, we see some problematic economic land practices emerge that will have major and long-standing repercussions on BIPOC and working class farmers. Sharecropping is a system where the landlord allows a tenant to use the land in exchange for a share of the crop. This encouraged tenants to work to produce the biggest harvest they could and ensured they would remain tied to the land and unlikely to leave for other opportunities. Crop mortgages, the crop lien system was a credit system that became widely used in the United States from the 1860s to 1940s. The Dawes Act of 1887 destroyed the collective reservation system by subdividing tribal lands into individual plots. This act authorized the federal government to break up tribal lands by partitioning them into these smaller plots. Only those Native Americans who accepted the individual allotments were allowed to become US citizens. The objective of the Dawes Act was to assimilate Native Americans into mainstream US society by annihilating their cultural and social traditions. As a result of the Dawes Act, over 90 million more acres of tribal land were stripped from Native Americans and sold to non-natives. Around 1890, Japanese laborers escaping the plantation work of Hawaii began to settle around San Jose, especially after the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, white farmers were eager for an alternative source of cheap labor to pick crops. When it became clear that these new immigrants were not just a population that could be exploited for cheap labor, but knowledgeable farmers and industrious business owners, they became a threat. Some Japanese immigrants saved enough money to buy their own farmland, further intensifying this perceived threat and fear of the ideal vision of white people at the forefront and as the face of agriculture in California. The California government launched active campaigns to attract white farmers to the region. They also changed the law several times to make it close to impossible for Asians to buy land. Discriminatory laws such as the California Alien Land Law of 1913 prohibited various people of color from owning land. Alien land laws were a series of legislative attempts to discourage Asian and other non-desirable immigrants from settling permanently in the US and territories by limiting their, abil their ability to own land and property. Because of the Naturalization Act of 1870 and that had extended citizenship rights only to African-Americans but not to other ethnic groups, these laws relied on coded language, excluding aliens ineligible for citizenship to prohibit primarily Chinese and Japanese immigrants from becoming landowners without explicitly naming any racial group. Various alien land laws existed in over a dozen states before they were ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court in 1952. Because of these laws, many Japanese had no choice but to work as sharecroppers. Others set up land trusts or began to have American born children in the hopes that the first to reach maturity would be able to own the family farm. In the 1920s and 30s, Filipino immigrants began to settle more in the region, but had developed a reputation for being difficult uh, after successfully organizing and demanding better treatment and higher wages in Hawaii. 
Like other Asians, they faced discrimination as they worked in the vast agricultural fields of the West. Filipino farmers and their history of successful farm labor organizing would later play a significant role in the building of the farm workers movement, organizing and striking alongside Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. In the 1940s, this legacy of Japanese farming the land was almost completely obliterated when they were forced into Japanese internment camps in 1942. They had to liquidate everything they couldn't carry with them. And at fire sale prices, farms, homes, cars, businesses, they were forced to leave behind $22 million of crops in the ground across California. The government saw to it that these crops were harvested, but not that the farmers were compensated. All the people of Japanese descent, including Japanese Americans who were US citizens, were incarcerated in internment camps from 1942 to 1945. After the war, only some returned to the Santa Clara Valley where they originally farmed, but now were destitute and had nothing. Over 130 years later, this history of Asians farming the land that was once known as the garden of the world is all but forgotten in the shadow of what became the Silicon Valley. Homesteading virtually came to a screeching halt with the enactment of Taylor Grazing Act, signed into law by President Franklin Roosevelt in 1934, which regulated grazing on federal public lands and authorized the US Secretary of the Interior to apportion grazing districts. In 1976, the Homestead Act was repealed with the passage of the Federal Land Policy and Management Act. The act authorized the US Bureau of Land Management to manage all federal lands. Homesteading was still allowed for about another decade in Alaska until 1986. Between 1940 and 1974, the number of black farmers fell from over 680,000 to only 45, uh, sorry, oh my God, 600, yeah, 681,000 to just 45, about 45,000, a drop of 93%. Further contributions to Black land loss include the Emancipation Proclamation Freed Slaves Act that did not provide the right to own land. After the Civil War, some states passed laws prohibiting persons of color from owning any real property. Lack of documentation, such as birth certificates, commonly, commonly used to prove identity and legal transactions, common situation after the Civil War. Land promised to freed Blacks through the Freemen's Bureau was ultimately returned to original white owners of the land. Lack of legal wills allowing Black property owners to pass the land to descendants and thereby build wealth. Jim Crow policies that allowed separate treatments. Racist implementation of the GI Bill. White veterans obtained low interest loans for homes, tuition benefits education, Black veterans were funneled into vocational educational programs and received few home and land loans. Racist farm lending by the USDA that denied Black farmers from credit to operate, improve, and expand farms. Sharecropping became common practice where tenants were charged high interest rates that created inescapable debt. Heirs property laws, all descendants of owners have a share in the land and must consent to sales. Partition sales and Torrens laws, systems of officially registering ownership of the land with the government enables forced sales of land, redlining and then gentrification. To this day, only 2% of agricultural land is owned by BIPOC farmers because of this history of institutionalized racism, wealth hoarding, and land dispossession. This is just some of the history that has led us to this current problem of the billionaire buyout, which Marzena will now tell us about. Marcena, you're on mute. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, okay, so part two, the billionaire buyout. 
the danger of large private farmlands is the monopoly that they are creating and the role that they play in determining uh, not only land use, but also our food system. Approximately 39% of the 911 million acres of farmland across the United States is rented out to farmers. And 80% of that rented farmland is owned by landlords who don't farm themselves. Data from the agricultural department shows these numbers. Buyers often purchase land from farmers who have owned the land for decades. And many of those farmers may be asset rich However, they are cash poor. Investments in farmland are growing across the country as people, including the ultra wealthy, like uh, look for new ways to grow their money. So, for example, Bill Gates started uh, stated that in his um, investment group, um, the purchases of farmlands. Um, were, were part, part of the plan and su suggested it was linked to seed and biofuel development. And while Gates does not own the majority of U.S. farmland, he is the largest private farmland owner, according to Land Report. To put that in perspective, 270,000 acres is nearly the size of Hong Kong. Um, War, worth 9.6 billion, John Malone, a media veteran, said he purchased farmland because they are not making it anymore. Malone noted in a CNBC interview that preservation was his primary motivation for purchasing the land and that he intends to purchase more land. He said that his properties serve as a reliable source of income and a solid hedge against inflation. In 2020, Gates made headlines for becoming the largest private farm land owner in the United States. And as said, he has accumulated more than 269,000 acres of farmland across 18 states in less than a decade. His farmland grows onions, carrots, and even the potatoes that are used to make the McDonald's French fries. And farmland has been a popular investment for a long time because of its stability. But one of the biggest increases in prices for farmland was uh, between July of, uh, of 2021 to July of 2022, where in Iowa fields, the, the, the prices increased by 36%. Um, Iowa State University's most recent land value survey conducted in 2021 showed a 30% statewide increase in land values at almost 14,000 an acre. Purdue University survey released in the summer of 2022 reported new land prices or uh, price records for Indiana. Uh, I spoke with Todd Kuth, a Purdue University agriculture economist who conducts the survey and stated our year over year change is around 30%. With top quality farmland statewide in Indiana averaging around 12,800 per acre, medium quality land was at 10,000, 10,500 per acre and poor quality land around 6,500. Those are all new highs in nominal and real terms, the highest we've ever experienced, Todd Kuth said. And back to Jen. An essential part of reimagining food systems and food futures must include redress of past harms that put barriers in place to BIPOC and disenfranchised people working with and caring for the land. There are many inspiring efforts to prioritize diversity and equity in farming on a grassroots level, as well as through government initiatives. Across the United States, organizations such as Soul Fire Farm in New York, for example, Mudbone Grown Farm in Portland, Oregon, and the Agriculture and Land-Based Training Association in Salinas, California, provide culturally relevant training and mentoring for new generations of diverse farmers and food cultivators. In the Southeast, Family Agriculture Resource Management Systems, 
farms is providing legal assistance to black farmers and all farmers from historically disadvantaged groups to retain ownership of their land. On the federal level in 2020, the Justice for Black Farmers Act was introduced. It aimed to provide training for aspiring black farmers, support for historically black colleges and universities, and reforms to USDA's civil rights process. Furthermore, the legislation proposes for the US government to purchase land which would be placed under an agricultural conservation easement and granted to black farmers. In 2017, the California Farmer Justice Collaborative led a passage of the Farmer Equity Act, which directed the California Department of Food and Agriculture to acknowledge racism in agriculture and take steps to address it across the department. The Illinois General Assembly passed the Farmers Equity Act as one piece of a larger package of bills focused on racial equity that was a top priority for the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus. In New York, Black Farmers United, New York State, an ecosystem of farm and food justice leaders have developed nine solutions to increase the number of BIPOC farmers in New York State. Among their asks is for $10 million in public funding for the Black Farmer Fund a nonprofit investment vehicle providing startup capital to black owned farm and food businesses, a 400 acre land donation to the Northeast Farmers Color of Land Trust and other critical support for a new generation of BIPOC Excuse farmers. Excuse me, Jen. Can I just ask that you just slow down in your reading please for the translators, thank you. This advocacy has had growing support for a new generation with Governor Cuomo, in response, convening a racial equity and diversity work group, which AFT participates in to develop strategic plans that will be implemented to increase the number of BIPOC farmers in New York State. On the local government level, an important aspect of thinking through food security means thinking about foodscapes and regional food plans that break down the idea of food production primarily occurring outside of cities. Bristol is a great case study on how this can be done in a holistic way. They've taken an approach to building a food plan for the city that has the health of people and the planet at its core. They also have a diverse understanding of agriculture that includes patchwork farming, food forests, community growing, and fringe agriculture. In order for our food systems to be secure and sustainable beyond having the wealth necessary to buy land, we need to think differently about our resources and available land and seriously map and invest in our urban agriculture infrastructure. And begin thinking of systems like foodscapes and the urban food shed. and thinking more expansively about collective land use and ways some of this land like forests can also be used as a key player in food security. Artists can play an important part in helping reimagine food systems and production. Here are just a few examples that have helped to model some important strategies on a variety of scales. In her project Swale, artist Mary Mattingly created a food forest on a barge that could travel New York's waterways.
The barge could be docked near neighborhoods that had limited access to fresh produce. Another artist in New York helping to reimagine food access is Linda Goody Bryan, who founded Project Eats in 2009. Project Eats is a living installation transforming vacant lots and rooftops into neighborhood based farms, supporting farm stands, pantries, prepared food, and community programs to catalyze creativity and cultivate greater food sovereignty across the city. Communities deserve to grow food uh, right where they live. This is art that feeds. On the West Coast, we have the LA-based collaborative duo known as Fallen Fruits. Their endless orchard project maps publicly accessible fruit throughout cities and creates maps and encourages the culture of food, cultivation, sharing, and gleaning. They've created maps for cities around the world. Another artist thinking about food access, uh, Oh, just one, one quick note. This is actually a monument to sharing uh, by fallen fruit. It is a orange grove, 32 orange trees installed along the historic parkway in Los Angeles. Okay. Another artist thinking about food access is public, uh, as public art, similar to the last orchard, is Canadian artist Diane Borsato, who worked with the city of Mississauga, Ontario to plant an orchard of heirloom apple varieties as a work of public sculpture. As a part of the artwork, the city has taken on the long-term commitment of care to tend to the orchard. In a work by artist Jeremy Deller that was done for Sculpture Projects Munster, he drew attention to the collective land use and history of Klein Gardens, where families share land together just outside the city and divide it into smaller lots so that each family can farm. In Edible Estates, artist Fritz, Fritz Haig rethinks the front lawn and proposes it as a site for food production and diversifying local ecologies. Much of my own work as an artist centers around education, ecologies, and the transformative possibilities of sharing domestic space as a community resource. Garbage Hill Farm in Chicago is an example of that. It's a small scale backyard artist run farm on a post industrial corridor serving Chicago's McKinley Park. The project models what is possible on a residential lot in an urban center. Garbage Hill Farm is com committed to food justice and sovereignty through increasing local food access with a focus on community sustained agriculture, redistribution of food to neighbors, 
running a small scale CSA and donating fresh produce to local food pantries throughout the 18 week growing season. We use solar energy, practice organic regenerative farming, closed loop production, and the elimination of single use plastics in distribution. The duplex on the property is designed as a site for community programs around art and ecology, and as a part-time residency for artists and culture leaders to rest and rejuvenate. The farm cultivates a community of foraging and self-production through hosting publicly accessible micro orchard with 39 fruit and uh, nut trees, almost enough trees to qualify as a official class one arboretum. We also have a public berry patch, restored prairie for pollinators, and a self harvest mutual aid garden in addition to a free seed library with over 50 seed varieties that reflect the backgrounds of the gardeners of the neighborhood. And accordingly to reflect our neighborhood, all signage and programming is available, Spanish, Mandarin, and English. As we transition to our final section on art and visions for funding the future, I wanna plant a seed for a project, which is a long-term goal for me. And part of the reason why I recently relocated to upstate New York, where I now spend nine months of the year returning to Chicago in the summer to be at Garbage Hill Farm. The goal of being up here is to start an arts ecology centered conservancy project. Mixed agricultural and wooded land in upstate New York will become a refuge for art and ecology, a site for creative and caring approaches for working with land and a BIPOC agriculture incubator. The project will bring together artists, environmentalists, and agrarians to think through food futures, land use, and the ongoing climate crisis through conservation residencies, intensives, and ongoing programs. In this, the land is not a bucolic backdrop for art production, but the focus of the work. The project reframes whitewashed utopian back to the land movements for this moment of urgency and centers the histories and relationships to the land of the original stewards and caretakers the Black homesteading movement of the exodusters and the Latinx and Asian peoples who were and are the back, uh, backbone of the agricultural landscape of this country that can, and that continues to feed the majority of people in the United States. And now to Marzena for our final section. Marzena, you're on mute again. <laughs> I apologize. So um, part four. Um, a, a little bit about me, I studied political science and philosophy in undergrad and after graduating, I worked for Senator Dick Durbin, and then I went on to work as a, par a paralegal in a law firm for that mostly focused on workers' compensation cases. My training in humanities and social sciences influences my artistic practice. Throughout my projects, I research local and global social issues in order to understand and articulate our human experiences. I contact individuals and organizations, and through our conversations and photographing, I formulate a visual language. 
I work through photographic series where images are anchored in a historical event. And then my formal interests in lighting, color, gesture, body position, connect individual images into these unimaginable bodies of work. The original motivation for my undergraduate studies carries through into my picture making and pushes me to look for new ways to maximize art's transformative potential. In 2020, along with Leonardo Kaplan and Rebecca Cressley, we spearheaded Prince for Hunger, a fundraiser of donated photographs by Chicago and Chicago-based artists. All the proceeds went directly to the Greater Chicago Food Depository in order to support vulnerable communities during the COVID-19 emergency. And with the help of my colleagues, we were able to raise uh, around $50,000. And after all the printing and expenses, uh, we donated around 37,000. I was born in Poland and grew up in Greece. And those two cultures have contributed to what I eat and who I am. I remember moving to the States and asking, where are all the fruit trees? <laughs> so the photographs that I am showing today I began to make in 2012, and over the years, they were made in multiple states. While photographing and driving around the states, I kept wondering, why does a handful of people own so much land? And of course, as Jen mentioned, several factors make farmland a uniquely um, a stable asset class. For one, the underlying commodities is absolutely essential. So demand for wheat, soybean, or corn, canola seeds will never go away. And as we have seen, the ongoing conflict in Eastern Europe has created a global supply shock where food prices have skyrocketed and very few farmers have actually benefited from those uh, food prices. Land is power, wealth, and land is about race and class. Land is ownership, land ownership reflects the inequalities in the United States. Um, Eileen Applebaum, an economist, said private equity is a factor for turning out billionaires. One percent of the world's farms control 70 percent of the world's farmlands. The biggest shift in recent years from small to big farms was in the United States. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, 23.5 million Americans live in communities with limited access to fresh and affordable produce. And unfortunately, most of Illinois' farmland is devoted to growing crops such as corn that are used to make biofuels. A U.N. report says that such practices pose a risk of desertification. It takes hundreds to thousands of years to generate an inch of topsoil that is as rich as the topsoil in Illinois. This is why soil is referred to as a non-renewable source. Southern Illinois is a rural area of high agriculture that is not producing a vast amount of food for direct consumption which would otherwise sustain our communities. The United States needs ambitious measures to fund, fund food farmers who are invested in soil-friendly practices. So as the UN report made it clear, a failure to protect the world's farmland would lead to famine, war, warfare, and massive disruptive migrations. We're wondering how can artists support farmers? Our project is artist driven. Um, we started various conversations with scholars, economists, uh, community groups, investors, and farmer and farmland owners. We are looking for ways to collaborate on art projects that redefine the good life, promote healthy eating, strengthen our communities, generate engagement, and we're looking for ways to inform regional legislative decision making. Our project's intention is to strengthen Illinois' food farmers' relationship to Chicago urban communities. So I drove out to meet with various farmers. Um, I photographed and spoke with Demarcus Medley, 
who lives in Galesburg with his wife and four children, hoping to succeed as an African-American farmer. He moved to Knox country from Chicago about 20 years ago, and his interest in farming grew in 2011 while recovering from back surgery. So for Medley and many other farmers that I spoke with, as well as uh, economist uh, Todd Kruth, I the collaboration with artists holds great value. So seems like in some ways we are onto something um, and looking for various ways to collaborate. I'm excited about the possibilities of this ambitious project and would like to invite you to help uh, us answer some of these questions. Um, the, we'll leave you with one question. How can artists use Chicago's political power to support and reward farmers for producing quality over quantity? Let's get our land back. And thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Um, at this time, if anybody has any questions for our presenters or comments, um, things that resonated with you that you want to share, um, please feel free to drop that in the chat or to come off mute at this time. Um, we'd love to hear any questions that you might have or comments. Um, for Jen, one uh, question that had came up while you were speaking, um, I think you had mentioned uh, upstate New York and someone in the chat wanted to know where exactly in New York um, that project had took place. Yeah. Hi, Linda. I just see that now. I don't see the comments when I'm in the presentation mode. I'm in Ithaca uh, currently. I live just outside of the city in Brooktondale, and I've been looking at land in Van Etten which is about 30 minutes from Ithaca. Other questions or things that came up for people um, that they'd like to ask our presenters? I guess one question that I can um, pose to the both of you. Um, oh, I see Manatee. Uh, someone has a, their hand raised. You can go ahead. Yes, um, I'm Manatee Smith, a producers one ad group. I left my information in the chat. Um, I think it was a um, very powerful presentation by the presenters. And my thing is moving forward and looking at the odds of that, that are against the small producers and the um, people of color, not only agriculturally, but economically, how can we pull our resources and unite together and take the, the economic you know, um, power that we have? and utilize that and leverage that with other funding to where we can you know set up our own land banks and buy the land and use it the right way you know for regenerated farming you know to feeding you know our communities because the power always lies in the hands of the people and what they do is keep us divided this is why you got the one percent controlling everything because 85% of the people, no matter what color you are, we don't understand what's going on. And there's a few of us that do understand, like in this group, but we got to make sure that we get the 85% or the ones that don't know and keep educating them, but also create a platform where we can work together, especially with technology. And not only, you know, changing the mindset, but we got to get down to the basics of economics development and pulling our, you know, nickels and dimes and quarters and don't depend on, you know, the government because they control the government and their resources, but we got the money within our own hands collectively.
I absolutely agree with you. And the way that we, I have been speaking to various farmers and as I mentioned, scholars and economists, I think that the way that artists can help is through various ways. Uh, like small time farmers have a difficulty with um, artwork that they may need for small things like business cards or their websites or even just photographs of, of uh, their produce. So that's one way that we were thinking that we can start to create a collaboration. But then I think on the bigger um, uh, level, as, as you mentioned, our idea of what does it, what a good life means and eating fresh vegetables, cooking uh, at home and um, using our diet and, and, our, and, and the way that we eat for our health is not something that is part of our culture. And as cultural producers, artists, I think that that is something that we can really push That that's, that sounds great, and you have my information. I'm thinking it's in the chat. You know, I'm interested. In, you know, in collaborating, and networking. I work with um minority farmers all around the country, and I think you know this keeping this momentum up and bringing you know other aspects and people of the same mind. You know, because the power is in the hands of the people. And I think what you guys are doing, and I was kind of shocked that it came from artists. <laughs> and, and that just shows you, you know, how things move, you know, that even though it's affecting the farmers, but you have artists bringing forth, you know, and, and the presentation itself was powerful. You know, and um, and I'm I'm excited. You know, to glad to be a part of this movement, and sitting down with you guys and organizing, planning, and strategizing, and thinking of the ways how we can empower the farmers. Because if we don't support the farmers, then who's going to feed us? And also understanding that land ownership is the basis for economic and generational wealth you know, and also feeding yourself. We are in a famine right now. You know, at the pestilence, there's come famine and then there's war, you know? And so we have to take matters in our own hands and we can't wait for, you know, big brother or those who helped put us in this situation because if they didn't change over the hundreds of years of what they have done and you showed in your presentation, the fact speaks for itself, they're not gonna change now. Although I will say I am optimistic about some of those changes that are beginning, right? Policy changes, both on a federal, local level, as well as collectives that are coming together to address you know, some of the concerns you shared around, well, how do we pool our resources to get access to land? And that, that is powerful. You know, we are stronger together. And I appreciate that you, you see the value in artists being a part of this movement. I think with the examples that I shared, it just shows that I think one of the most important jobs that artists have is to address this deficit of imagination, right? And to help people to imagine different ways that we could approach um, the world, world building, being in this world together. And I'm so inspired by the projects that I got to share with you. Like Mary Mattingly's work is incredible, you know? Um, and I just think that to have that kind of vision and yeah. And also, you know, creating a platform to feature those artists, right? To to show what what they're working on is is really important to us as well. Um, thank you so much, um, Fortune.